welcome everybody to today's hand lunch. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Simon von Behrendt, uh, giving the head talk today, who is not only uh, an Einstein fellow, but also my office mate. <laughs> <laughs> and as such, I have a very good knowledge that he's a real expert of galaxy clusters, and in particular, merging galaxy clusters. And as such, he will be telling us today uh, about merging galaxy clusters, observations of particle acceleration at, at cluster shot fronts. So, Simon, please. Uh, thank you, Agos. So, yeah, I will be talking about merging galaxy clusters, and there are also some people here at CFA involved, like uh, Georgiana, uh, Philippe, uh, Bill, and Christine. And I'm um, also presenting some work from the merging cluster collaboration, which is led by Will Dawson at UC Davis, and also results from the uh, LOFAR Surface Key Science Project, which is led by Hugh Prutgering in Leiden. So, a uh, brief outline of my talk. So, we'll start with an introduction. Uh, what we know basically about radio observations of merging galaxy clusters because that's what I'm talking about uh, in this talk. Then I will um, present two of my favorite clusters, so basically the sausage and the toothbrush cluster, that's their nicknames. Uh, these are their official names. And I don't uh, talk a little bit about some next steps, so basically work in, in progress, which I'm working on uh, now. So first, uh, start with a kind of already old simulation of large scale structure formation where you basically see the cosmic web and you see uh, galaxy clusters sitting at the nodes of this cosmic web. And if you basically run a shock finding algorithm on this kind of large scale structure uh, formation, so basically where there is gas included, what you can find is that this cosmic web basically is traced out also by shocks. There are shocks accreting onto the cosmic web and these typically have quite a high Mach number. So these are the Mach numbers of the shock where you can see these shocks have Mach numbers of basically between 10 and 100 at the cosmic web. Well, if you look at the location of the clusters at these nodes, you see that the shocks uh, have lower Mach numbers. So typically like two, three, four, uh, that's ba basically it. However, if you look at the total energy dissipated in basically in such a volume, then actually most of the energy is dissipated in these internal shocks in clusters, in these low Mach number shocks. And uh, why is that the case? That's simply because the density there is just much higher than in the very low density filaments around the cosmic web, so really most of the energy is dissipated in clusters. And if you now do radio observation of some clusters, what you can find is that in some cases you can find kind of like arc-like structures. So this is a radio image of a cluster in red here and an x-ray image here in blue, where you can see arc-like structures around these clusters. And the idea is that basically these arc-like structures trace shocks from large-scale structure formation. And this is one example here, and there's another example here, so they come in great uh, variety. So the idea is that a small fraction of the gravitational energy from this large-scale structure formation is basically channeled into the production of cosmic rays because we observe radio emission, so synchrotron radiation, that directly means relativistic particles and magnetic fields. So these relativ relativistic particles have to be produced somehow. And the idea is that happens in, in these shocks uh, caused by this large-scale structure formation. So if we look at radio observation of clusters, we have to kind of like give a kind of overview of what, what can we find there. Um, of course, we can find AGN. Well, everyone knows about AGN, so they are quite typical. And what you can often find in clusters are this kind of like weird looking AGN. So this are, is a classical FR2 radio galaxy, which is kind of symmetric with kind of hotspots at the end. And this is a more like disturbed FR1 galaxy, which indicates some interaction probably with its environment, right? So you see this tail coming out of this galaxy. So the radio jets here are bent. What you can also find is more like larger structures in galaxy clusters, or more diffuse emission, and these are called radio halos and relics. Um, these are really diffuse and have a, a megaparsec size. And it's important to consider here that um, the lifetime of these electrons, because they lose energy because they emit singleton radiation, the lifetime of these electrons is rather short. It's something like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 years. Uh, or at least less than 10 to the 8 years. It depends on the frequency where you're looking. So somehow these electrons must be really accelerated in situ in the medium itself. So what you cannot do is basically start from like, uh, start from the hotspot here where your particles are accelerated and then diffuse these particles outwards and fill the entire volume of a cluster with radio emission because you simply do not have enough time for that. In that time still basically all these electrons have already lost their energy and you cannot see them anymore in the radio. So you need some other mechanism to accelerate these particles. And in this talk I will mainly talk about these really large diffuse structures and these are found in uh, merging clusters. And I should also mention there are mini halos which are found in cool core clusters. 
So this is an example of an extra image of a cool core cluster from the review from Markovich. And this is an exa a famous example of a merging cluster, which is the bullet cluster, of course. So in this case, I will talk about merging clusters. And these halos and relics are exclusively found in these merging uh, clusters. I should also mention that the magnetic fields in these clusters are in the range of like 0.1 to 10 microgauss. We don't really know exactly what the precise value is because it's very hard to measure. I will briefly touch uh, upon this later. Um, but this is roughly the range what we think the magnetic fields are in this cluster. And we, of course, we need magnetic fields because singleton radiation, if you want to have that, you need magnetic fields. So magnetic fields must, of course, be present. And we know that also from other observations. So what are the questions we can ask here? Of course, we can ask the questions, what is the physics of the shocks and turbulence found in merging clusters? And what is the origin of this cosmic rays we see in some of these radio observations, like these arc-like structures or more the diffuse halos? And also the magnetic fields. And then, in particular, you can uh, think about particle acceleration mechanism. So what is the precise mechanism? Um, what is the acceleration efficiency of shocks? Because this is important, because if you can channel a large fraction of the shock energy into relativistic particles, that basically means that you also, in that case, basically, um, there could be a significant en energy content in these particles. So for example, if you um, want to calculate the mass of a cluster, um, you assume it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, but if there is another pressure component in the cosmic rays and you don't know about that, then you basically do not correctly calculate the cluster mass. And there's also a question about magnetic field amplification because surprisingly in some of these clusters we measure fields that are quite high. And uh, too high to, um, to just come from simply, um, uh, simply uh, well, very simple physics. So you need some additional fix physics here. And this point I already addressed, so basically it's important their contribution to the pressure budget, also the magnetic fields. So now again, going back to the halos and relics, because I didn't really tell you uh, what they are. So uh, starting with radio halos. So radio halos are really sm uh, smooth, large scale, roughly one megaparsec size structures, which uh, more or less follow the X-ray emission from the ICM. So the image actually, a radio halo looks more or less like an X-ray image of a cluster to some extent. It's just like a diffuse <coughs> extended thing, which kind of peaks in the center and then fades towards the outskirts. And um, they're only found in the curves clusters. And there's another interesting thing that if you plot the, basically the power of this radio halo, so the integrated flux and basically then taking their distance into account, if you plot the power of these radio halos, you can find that they basically correlate with X-ray luminosity. So these are basically uh, radio halo clusters and merging clusters where each point is basically the power of such a halo. And this is the X-ray luminosity, which is just a proxy of mass. And basically what you can see is that the radio halo power scales with cluster mass. And that's maybe not so surprising because the idea is that a, a part of the gravitational energy of the cluster is converted into non-thermal energy. So you expect that uh, the gravitational energy, of course, scales with cluster mass. So you expect so, such a correlation. Although also, of course, with a uh, large scatter because you can have major mergers, minor mergers. Mergers can be complex. You can triple mergers. So you expect a lot of scatter on these clusters. If you look at clusters which are relaxed, which do not host these um, radio halos, you can only find upper limits. So you can still look like, is there a halo present? But you don't find anything. And then you can put an upper limit on the flux. And then you can put an upper limit in the diagram. So these relaxed clusters really fall in a distinct region in the diagram. So they simply do not have halos, at least with the current sensitivities we have with instruments. So there are two models which explain these radio halos. And there are two competing models. Uh, the first one is the turbulent reacceleration model. This was proposed like roughly 15 years ago. And the idea is that these electrons, which you see in the radio, are accelerated by MHD turbulence, which is caused, and the turbulence is basically amplified by the merger event. Uh, there are some predictions from this model. That's nice, because it's a very complicated model and very poorly understood. So um, one of the predictions, of course, is that you should only find radio halos in merging clusters, because that's only where you amplify the turbulence. So that's a kind of nice prediction. And that's one which is immediately verified, because we know they are found in merging clusters. And also, they, you expect kind of steep and curved radio spectra. I won't explain why that's the case, because that's kind of complicated. Um, but indeed, also, these this radio halos with this steep and curved spectra have been found. So this is a Nature paper from um, uh, Gianfranco Brunetti in 2008, where he found the first example of such a halo with this extreme uh, steep spectrum, which is kind of predicted by the turbulent uh, reacceleration theory. There is a competing model, however, and that's the hadronic and secondary model. And there's also something to say for that model. So in the ICM, you should also, over the lifetime of a cluster, build up relativistic protons. And you can generate these protons in AGN. You can generate them, um, accelerate them at shocks. Um, 
And these protons cannot escape the cluster. So they live there forever, basically, because they don't lose energy, because they have quite a large mass compared to electrons. So they don't lose energy by singleton radiation. So they sit in the cluster. And they can collide with, like, thermal protons. And if they collide, basically, you get decay products. And these decay products, in the end of the chain, produce relativistic electrons. And then these electrons, of course, emit, again, singleton radiation. So during this decay chain, also gamma ray emission is expected. And the prediction is that you get parallel radio spectrum. Now, that's um, something where people have been looking for very hardly over the last years, but um, no gamma ray emission has been found. Of course, it's a very hard measurement, um, so there's still some tension here. But that basically indicates that most people actually favor now this turbulent uh, reacceleration model and think that some emission from this mechanism must be present, but um, probably at the level where we cannot observe it uh, now at, with current present radio telescope. So. Um, yeah, I said, yeah, probably like 70% of the community favors this model. But there are still people also who um, would still try to kind of reconcile the observations with this model. Quick, reacceleration of, of what? What was the initial acceleration supposed to result? Um, in this case, right? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So um, there are various options. So one of them could be this one. So they couple it back to this one. That's basically also to keep people happy in some way because you can involve both mo models. So it's kind of a political solution in some, some sense. But the other way is, for example, radio galaxies in clusters. So radio gal galaxies have radio lobes. And if you have like a giga year of time or five giga year of time, these radio galaxies move around in the cluster potential and they dump relativistic electrons. So over the lifetime of a cluster, you accumulate <coughs> these electrons. But that's a good question, actually. And the answer is not known. But these are two of the possibilities people invoke here. And I come actually back to reacceleration because this is actually also involved for radio relics. So if I go for radio relics, these are really different structures. So they are not diffuse. They are kind of like arc-like, have higher surface brightness, and they're found in the outskirt of clusters. So not, they're not centered. And uh, this is a nice example here uh, of a cluster. So X-ray emission again in blue here, then in radio emission again in red. And uh, these are roughly the properties. So they also have like sizes of a megaparsec, but they're really elongated. And they're really highly polarized, which is also quite telling. I'll go to that, I'll go to, uh, that later. And if you look at this picture, actually, the basic idea is that if you get a binary cluster merger for this cluster, is that this is what happens. So this is a hydro simulation, kind of a toy-like simulation, where you collide two clusters. This shows the temperature map. You collide the two clusters, the core pass. And at the moment, the core pass, basically, you generate a shock in the ICM, and the shock propagates outwards towards the outskirts. And the idea is basically that these shocks are these kind of like radio arcs where you accelerate uh, these particles. That's the basic idea in this, for this cluster because this is a pretty nice merger apparently. So you get the kind of symmetric shocks in this case. Okay. Then of course we have to ask the question, so how can these shocks precisely accelerate the particles? Right? Because you can say shock, accelerate particles, that sounds kind of like easy, but it's not so easy. Because these shocks have a low Mach number, and low Mach number shocks are difficult. They are difficult to work with because a lot of the analytical theories basically break down here. You cannot use many of the approximations you can use for high Mach number shocks. So the most basic scenario is that what basically happens is what we call diffusive shock acceleration. So particles basically, so this is the shock front here, particles basically can scatter across and back from the shock, and each time they basically cross the shock, this is the Fermi 1 acceleration, each time they cross they gain some amount of energy and this process repeats it over and over again and in the end you basically produce a relativistic uh, electron you can, starting from the thermal pool at, this, at least that's the idea with uh, diffusive shock acceleration now people have pointed out this is actually very difficult to do because what is the problem here the problem this works very well for high Mach number shocks but is has been shown basically not work for shocks which occur in clusters so Mach numbers of like two uh, three three at most because that's the highest Mach number shock we know of in a cluster so uh, very recent PIC simulations actually have shown that this is actually different what happens here. So PIC simulations are particle and cell simulations where you basically really fully simulate uh, all the forces on the particle. Of course, that's very computationally intensive. So this is work done here actually at uh, Harvard and also by uh, Caprioli and Spitskovsky. They basically show actually that you kick start the acceleration by a somewhat different mecha mechanism here. That's called shock drift, drift acceleration. Once you start the acceleration process, when you get this going, and after these particles have become mildly relativistic, you can basically start up the diffusive shock acceleration mechanism. So that kind of like solves the problem like that you have a low Mach number of shocks. And that's very recent work and actually very nice because that probably solved one of the main problems here, if this is true, of the low Mach numbers of these shocks. 
And in this case, what's also nice is that you have a um, relation between the Mach number sh of shocks and the observed radio spectral index. So if you can, for example, measure the Mach number from shocks from X-ray observation, you can basically check with radio observation if this matches your uh, spectral index. And I will go to this because this is one of the few tests we can actually perform of this model. There is another solution to basically the low Mach number problem. So basically, low Mach number shocks are not very efficient in accelerating. And that's, again, you start with, like, uh, re-acceleration. So you can start with electrons which are relatively multi-relativistic and they come from various processing clusters. That's not strange, like radio galaxies. And once you already have like a multi-relativistic electron, you cannot see it because it doesn't emit singleton radiation at the wavelengths uh, we can see from the ground. It's just very low frequencies which we cannot observe. It's blocked by the ionosphere. So these particles can hide. But once you have a shock, you can re-accelerate them to higher energies and then they become visible again. So this is another way basically to solve this low acceleration efficiency problem. And um, there is some, also some support for this model because in some cases, these relics look kind of weird. They look kind of like, not really like they trace really nice shocks, but they have kind of like morphologies which are kind of like hybrids between radio galaxies and relics. So it's kind of like a weird intermediate case. And one of the nicest example is actually the Frontier Field Cluster Max J0717. So this is work done here also with Christine Jose and um, Philippe and Jordana. So this is an image of the Max J0717. You can see it's a tra train wreck here. So this is like the X-ray emission. It's very complex. And the radio emission here is this large relic. And what you can see here is this kind of like radio source in the middle sitting of this relic. And if you zoom in with higher resolution observation, you can actually see this is just like this tilt radio galaxy. So this tilt radio galaxy is kind of ending here and it's fading into this kind of like large radio relic. So this kind of like supports to some extent the idea that maybe there is indeed a connection between radio galaxies and some form of shock acceleration. And there is quite some evidence here that this indeed tra traces a shock, although we not directly see the shock in the surface brightness jump. And you can kind of imagine why that's the case, because this is like a complete mess. But if you look at the temperature dump, of the temperatures basically, what you can find is this relic really traces a hot shock heated region with temperatures of like excess of 20 kV. It's very hot, so it's very difficult to measure with Chandra, but it's extremely hot. You can make temperature maps in different ways with larger binning, but in all cases you get kind of this extremely hot 20 plus kV gas tracing this this radio relic. So indeed supporting the idea that some form of shock heating is present there. And it's probably more difficult to recognize in the surface brightness profiles as really seeing the jump because, because yeah, it's, this is like a quadruple merger event. Or, so it's a very complicated cluster. So this gives some support for the re-acceleration. Of course, it's not direct support, but it's kind of suggested. And then there are some other puzzles. So there are also cases where we have nice shocks. So this is work from Helen Russell. This is the cluster ABLE 2146, where you can see two nice symmetric shocks on both sides of the cluster. This is a process on sharp mask image, where you can see basically the shocks a bit more clear. And what we did with Helen Russell is we did very deep GMRT observation of this cluster to look for relics, because we said, hey, we see shocks, we should find relics in this cluster. Got an easy case here, nice shocks. So Mach numbers of around two. But we do, did not find any relics, so big puzzle. So why do these shocks not accelerate particles? And these radio, radio observations were really deep. These were not like some shallow observations. These were targeted, extremely deep GMRT observations at low frequencies. But nothing uh, was found. So this is still a mystery. It's not clear why these shocks do not accelerate particles. So in a re-acceleration model, you can think of maybe there was not a nearby radio galaxy present. That could be a solution. Of course, it's how do you really prove this? This is still uh, more difficult. So this is just a puzzle. So now going to a cluster where we know a little bit more about, so that's the sausage cluster. And this is a big merging cluster with a nice uh, symmetric double radio relic, so indicating a binary merger event, so pretty clean merger event. And also because the radio surface brightness is quite high here, it indicates that basically we see the shock fronts probably close to edge on, because they're really projected on the outskirts of the cluster, which makes it nice because that kind of constrains the merger scenario. And what we could do for this cluster, so this is an, a zoom in of this cluster. So basically what happens here, we think, is this is basically tracing the shock. The front of the shock is roughly where the line is. It moves outwards over time with a certain velocity. And you inject, part, you accelerate basically the particles at the front of the shock, basically where the shock is. And in the post-shock region, you get energy losses because these electrons radiate, they lose their energy. And a direct consequence of that is that the radio spectral index steepens because the highest energy particles lose their energy faster. This is like the basic synchrotron theory. So this is the region of the energy losses. So basically, if you make a spectral index map of this radio relic, you should see a gradient in the spectral index from flat spectrum in the front 
active acceleration to steep spectrum in the back, basically indicating these energy losses. And that's exactly what we observed for this cluster. So for the first time, very clearly, where you can see this very big <coughs> gradient in spectral index. Another thing what you expect here is that you have a shock. So what you do is you compress the ICM with the magnetic fields in it. And if you compress in one direction, you align the magnetic fields. So you only you align them. And that causes very high polarization fraction if you have a, at least a relatively strong shock or a shock with a Mach number of two or a little bit more. And that's also what we observe. So these are the polarization electric field factors. So the magnetic field is exactly perpendicular to that. I didn't plot that because that doesn't make a nice plot because everything aligns in the plane of the relic. And you can see that these electric field factors are really, um, in this case, raised, uh, radi extending radially outwards from the cluster as what you would expect if you comp have a shock, if you compress the magnetic field. And this polarization fraction is also really high. It's so a polarization fraction of like 16%, which is very close to the maximum you can get with singleton radiation. So this is actually one of the most highly polarized structures uh, in the sky. It's quite amazing. And also you have to imagine this thing is really huge. It spends eight arc minutes on the sky, so it's like a quarter of the size of the moon. Well, this is at a redshift of 0.2, so it's, it's big. You could see it by eye if you had radio eyes with, good res with like normal resolution, visual resolution. <coughs> Something what you also, of course, want to confirm is that there is really a shock present, and that's more difficult. So one thing what you can do is you want to measure the temperature dump, and that's only possible with Suzaku because you need to have enough sensitivity in basically in this pre-shock region where the X-ray emission is extremely faint, and so basically Chandra and XMM do not have enough sensitivity for that. And if you basically plot the temperature profile, this is worked by Akamatsu, and also later confirmed also by Georgiana, is that you find indeed an increase of the temperature at the location of the radio, radio relic, indicating roughly a shock with a Mach number of three, roughly of three. Of course, it's hard to pin down because the resolution is quite poor. You have point sources, but luckily, um, there is, of course, XMM and Chandra observations here, so you can do something about the point source, but still, the resolution is poor. But it indicates a Mach number of something like three. Well, the radio spectral index actually indicates a somewhat stronger Mach number, in this case, like something more like four, uh, or even a bit more. So there's a little bit, there's some tension here, although later in observations indicate, this is from the radio spectral index basically computed, indicate that this tension is not as big as we initially thought. You can also go to the south because there's this fainter, more irregular relic present, and again there you find the Suzaku temperature jam. This is work from Akamatsu, which he uh, just submitted. So roughly Mach 2 shock, a little bit weaker, it seems. Now this is work from Georgiana. What you also want to find is like the density jump or the surface brightness jump. And for that, Chandra is really great because it has really great resolution, low backgrounds. Um, but that turns out to be quite hard. So uh, this is the Chandra observation of these clusters. And you can see several things where there are basically surface brightness discontinuity present. And one of, this is basically the profile in the northern sector here, which Georgiana made. And what you can find, actually, that there is a jump at this location. So that's roughly at the location here. You can see it by eye in the surface brightness profile, indicating a very weak Mach number shock, if this is a shock, of course. But likely it's not a cold front. Likely this is a shock. So very weak Mach number shock. On the other hand, at the relic location, so where this dash line is, you only find kind of like a bump in the pro It's not really clear. It's not like really something is maybe going on there, but there's not enough counts, basically, to really say what's going on, basically. Deeper observation would be required here to really tell if this is indeed a shock or not. At the moment, at least from the surface brightness jump, um, we cannot really tell. We cannot really prove this. So this is a bit surprising. So we find some discontinuities, but not at the location, or not like a really clear one at the location of the radio relic. But of course, it's really hard to do it there because you're really in the outskirts of the cluster. So you're really pushing things to the limit. So you have to worry about everything, basically. So um, yeah, it's, to, to that extent, it's also not too surprising. Hard. What you also want to see is that basically confirm this is really a merging cluster and what is the merger scenario. Of course, the X observations are really helpful because you can see it's a merger. That's pretty obvious. But if you actually look at the galaxies themselves, so this is basically a map of the galaxy density, you can really indeed see that this is really looks like a nice binary merge event. So this is based on the red sequence number density galaxies based on uh, super observations, uh, which Will Dawson analyzed and recently published. What you can also do is you can measure the velocities of the galaxies in the cluster, and you can basically use that to get an idea about the dynamics of the system. So this is again work by Will Dawson, where he obtained roughly a spectra for 200 galaxies, 200 cluster members, basically showing that the radio velocity difference between the two subgraphs is basically zero, is consistent with zero. And you can only get that basically if you have a merger in the plane of the sky. So this confirms our 
picture basically that this merger is kind of seen close to uh, edge on really happening in the plane of the sky. So not along the line of sight, because otherwise you expect some radial velocity difference between the two. And from this analysis, what this also comes out is that this is roughly a one-to-one -one merger. Uh, One-to-two is not excluded because um, it's difficult to estimate a mass. Um, and it may also makes it a very nice study, for example, to study self-interacting dark matter, which you can basically do with merging clusters because they have dark matter present. If you throw two dark matter balls together, and you can basically look at the fact if they slow down or not, basically during the merger, if you can measure that. That has been done, of course, for the Buddha cluster, by uh, Scott. But this is also a prime target to do this kind of thing, in particular because we know the merger scenario so well, and because we have the inclination angle very well constrained. So basically, it's happening in the plane of the sky, uh, more or less. Now, finally, what you can also do is you can do weak lensing. So um, basically, to directly measure the cluster masses. And uh, again, you see this, these are the weak lensing contours from a super observation. Again, you find kind of a rough bimodal uh, distribution. Uh, don't look at all the details of the galaxy contours because weak lensing is difficult. And this is a very crowded galactic field, as you can see. Most of the things you see are, are stars. The galaxies are very hard to look at this low resolution, very hard to find in this low resolution image. But it confirms we have a bimodal merger event. But the main interesting thing here is if you compare this merger with, for example, the Buddha cluster, that in this case you have a merger of two 10 to the 15 solar masses clusters. And that's much more energetic, for example, than the Buddha cluster, where you have basically a merger with a 10 to the 15 solar mass cluster and 10 to the 14 solar mass cluster. So this is really like one of the most extreme events there is. There are a couple more of these, for example, the frontier clusters are also these type of mergers, but they're typically more massive. So this is really like a very nice example of a really relatively well-behaving um, merger, which you can study all kind of like uh, processes. Uh, uh, one more thing, because we can see this uh, thing edge on, we can also actually estimate the magnetic field in this cluster via a trick. So this is the relic again, and basically the relic has a certain width. You can measure that just from the image. In this case, it's roughly 50 kiloparsec. And what now determines the width of the relic? Of course, there's projection effects, but projection effects do not play a huge role in this, for this cluster. Um, it's also the characteristic time scale of the aging of the electrons, right? Because they are accelerated here and then they move downstream and they lose their energy and at some point they fade away and you don't see them anymore. And of course the shock speed, basically the shock downstream velocity. So that basically sets the width of the relic. And we can measure this number, the shock downstream velocity, from X-ray observations. If you take, for example, take the Suzaku uh, measurement with a Mach number. We also know an expression for this, the electron cooling time scale, basically, the aging time scale. That's just this equation, that's a simple equation, which is just comes from synchrotron theory, and that basically says that the aging depends on the magnetic field strength in the cluster. So basically the magnetic field is the only unknown. We know the width, we know the velocity, so we can basically write this equation here with the only unknown, the magnetic field in the cluster. The, the energy density of the cosmic microwave background, of course, is of course very well known at any redshift, so you can just compute that. So basically this is what we plugged in, this is the profile of this relic, so basically this is the profile just across it. And you can plot this equation basically. So basically the width of a relic as a function of magnetic field. And then basically put in the width we have. So we have a width of 50 kiloparsec here. So we have here or here. So the only annoying thing is here that there are basically two possible solutions because of the way this equation works. You get two solutions basically. So either the magnetic field is quite high, so something like five, six microgauss, or it's kind of like one microgauss. And we don't really know what the answer is uh, here. So but other the two possible solutions to get an estimate of the, of the magnetic field. And this is very hard. There are very few ways to do this. So this is like quite nice actually that we can do it for this case. Although we have this kind of two possible solutions. So we have to figure another way basically to figure that out. And one way would be to look at inverse Compton X-ray emission if you could, for example, detect that or set a limit on it. So these are the two solutions. Now this is some very recent works. I don't have like science results. I just like to show the images. So these are um, GVLA observations of the cluster. And this actually showed that the merger is actually somewhat more complex. You can see all kind of additional structures here besides this large radio relic. And if you zoom in here, actually, what you can look is that this radio relic is actually, they're basically substructures. They're like sheets. And uh, this is actually also what simulations indicate. If you do simulations of uh, clusters, including um, some sh form of shock acceleration, you get as more irregular like sheet-like structures. And this is probably what we kind of see here. So it's not a perfect like, nice shock, straight shock, but of course there's some projection effects. The shock uh, propagation velocity depends on the local properties of the ICM, so you get some, <coughs> um, every, not everything is as nice as like a simple 
outward spherical stroke. So um, I will working on this like the next year, hopefully to learn something more also about the spectral index, how that behaves as function of like this kind of like substructures here you see in the relic. Okay, enough about this cluster. So going to the next cluster and going to LOVER observations. So LOVER is a new radio telescope and it allows us to study these sources at very low frequencies. So what I presented in the previous slides was observations basically at the traditional one gigahertz range or 610 megahertz or two gigahertz, what people typically do. But what you would like to do is to study this object at very low frequencies. And why do you want to do that? Because these objects are very bright at low frequencies and they fade very quickly at high frequencies. So it's much easier to study them there. And you're also more sensitive to these electrons with a steep spectra, right? Because steep spectra means bright at low frequencies, very faint at high frequencies. And this is an uh, example of the Lover telescope. It doesn't look like a classical telescope, but you just can think of this as a classical telescope. You can couple these antennas on the ground in stations, and they just simulate a dish. And the same for this kind of like antennas sitting underneath here. They look strange, but they just simulate a dish. So you can just think as, as, as it of a dish, except that they don't point. They cannot move. You can still point by basically doing uh, tricks in electronics. That's how you point here. And in that way, basically, you can also simulate multiple dishes by only using one station. So it's a very powerful instrument, for example, to do a survey because you can basically, you have complete freedom to point there on the sky and to point there on the sky at the same time and basically observe without having a dish because you can only point the dish at one location in the sky. And this is like a zoom in of the antennas. You see they are really simple. This looks more fancy, but inside they're just like simple dipoles and they're just covered by plastic. So that's why it looks fancy. It's really cheap plastic. And <laughs> there's nothing fancy about it if you look inside of here. It's like really low tech stuff in some sense. The, the high tech stuff is in the computers. It's not in these antennas. <coughs> now, why have people not done this before? Because this seems like an obvious thing to do. Well, there's one main problem and that's the ionosphere. It's a bit like seeing in the optical. And this is an image of the ionosphere. Basically, there's a movie, a radio, image made every 30 seconds with three arc minute resolution, three arc minutes, so that's basically worse than your eye. And you can already see at this resolution if the ionosphere is not well behaving, for example, because the sun <laughs> had an uh, explosion, for example, so that ionizes some more of the up Earth's. Basically, the ionosphere gets more ionized and things get really <laughs> nasty and all the sources move around and this basically blurs your image because if you want to make a deep image, you want to stack all these like snapshots, but if you stack them, everything blurs out. And what you basically have to do is correct for this kind of like blurring. Of course, if you have a quiet ionosphere, you, it's less of a problem, but this is only a three arc minute resolution. If you would look at this image at like five arc second resolution, things would again look really wild. So if you want to make high resolution observations, you have to correct for this. And this is really difficult. That's why um, this takes a long time <laughs> to process. So what we did for LOFAR was observe this cluster because it's bright, it's an easy target. It's in a northern sky, it's high up. This is another merging cluster. It's more complex than a sausage cluster here. So this is like the main relic, which we call the toothbrush in the north of the cluster. This is a radio halo. There are some additional fainter relics. And this is the X-ray image from XMM, from work from Georgiana, showing roughly like bimodal merger event here with this kind of weird relic sitting on the front of here. And this radio, radio halo basically filling the entire cluster volume with radio emission. Now, this is the LOVER image. So after a lot of hard work, this is the LOVER image of this cluster. You can compare that to previous DMRT observations, which is also a telescope which can work at low frequencies. Um, and you can see the enormous improvement we make here by using LOVER because we have really long baselines up to 100 kilometer and we have great sensitivity. So we can really make like an order of magnitude improvement in the quality of this low frequency images um, to really study these relics in detail at low frequencies, which we could never do before. Same frequency, 150 megahertz. It's ex identical, so that's why it's a nice comparison. So it shows basically the improvement you can get um, by, yeah, by having more baselines, having more collecting area, and having more advanced processing techniques, basically. And these are like uh, a zoom in, so this is a high resolution image, and these are some low resolution images more showing the radio halo. You can, because you have radio telescopes, you have long and short baselines, you can make high and low resolution images, so that's kind of a great trick you can play. Um, to highlight different kind of spatial skills in your data set. And again, what we think here is that this traces an outward moving shock, although it's a kind of weird shock because it has a really weird, long, elongated shape. We have the energy losses here, so again, we expect this step, uh, spectral steepening. And if this, again, a spectral index map where you go from a flat spectrum here to a steeper spectrum in the back. So again, confirming this kind of picture. And this is a low frequency spectral index map that made between uh, the GMRT at 610 megahertz and lower at 150 megahertz. We already knew that there was a spectral index gradient from higher frequency observations, but we now basically also confirm 
the spectral index gradient is also present at the low frequencies. Of course, we expected that, so it would be weird if it would be not the case, but uh, it's, of course, good to test that. Now going to the Chandra observations of this cluster. So I've been working on this with some help of Philippe and Georgiana. So this is a temperature map of the cluster, and what you can see is that in the south of this cluster, you can kind of see this hot region of gas, so roughly like 14 keV uh, gas. So this, of course, indicates like something like shock heating. And this is significant if you look at the temperature uh, here and the temperature here. This difference is, is significant, so it's not like it's... Um, yeah, there's really a change here. Well, if you look in the north where the toothbrush is, not a lot seems to be happening. So that's kind of like a bit puzzling because you expect everything spectacular to happen here because this is where this huge relic is. Well, it looks a bit boring here in the temperature map. This is the Chandra image itself, and if you look carefully, actually, you can see there is a shock here, and there is probably a cold front here, very similar to the Buddha cluster. So this is the shock, we think, and this is the cold front, and uh, this is the overlay on the lower image, so the Chandra image on the lower image. And we can basically look like, are there really shocks present here? Uh, so we can look at the temperatures, we can look at the surface brightness profile. So this is the surface brightness profile in the south at this location, and you can see very clear Mach 1.4 shock, roughly. So pretty obvious. And... Uh, this is confirmed from the temperature dump by really uh, taking a region, so not taking the temperature map, but taking a precise wedge region here, exactly at the edge, and uh, taking the region here. And you measure the two temperatures, and you get like a temperature. To, from the temperature dump, you get a Mach number of 1.7, with a somewhat larger error, of course, because temperature measurements are more difficult. Now we go to the north, right? You cannot see something obvious here. It's not, not really clear. So there's obviously not a very strong shock present there. And this is the profile there. So... Um, and this is basically where the radio emission is. So you can kind of see that there is kind of a kink in the profile, which, if you fit a shock model to it, suggests a Mach 1.2 shock. So very weak shock, clearly at least not a strong shock. A bit surprising, though, right? Because we had this huge relic present there, and in the south we didn't have a relic, but we see a, actually a nice shock, so a bit weird. And this is actually the edge of the radio halo. So somehow the radio emission kind of knows about where the change in the profile happens, um, but at least in the case of the Northern Relic, it seems to be a very mild chase, change, so just a kind of kink or, or very low Mach number shock. And what we also can confirm here is that this is a cold front also. This is the density, basically, uh, sorry, the surface brightness profile from which you can get the density jump. And basically, if you measure the temperatures, you get the inverse of that. So basically, the pressure is constant across this kind of edge, um, confirming this is a cold front. Very similar, actually, to the bullet cluster. So this would be the bullet, and this would be the shock in front of the bullet cluster, except that the Mach number of these shocks is not as high as in the bullet cluster. So now going back to the north, because that's where there's a real puzzle. So is there a shock in the north? And um, if there is not, can we put a limit on the Mach number? So I basically took the profile and overplot a Mach 1.2 shock. And you can kind of see, like, okay, that's kind of consistent with the data, at least. You can also overplot a Mach 1.5 shock. And you can see there starts to be come some tension here. You can kind of see this deviation here. And you can overplot a Mach 2.8 shock. That is basically the lowest Mach number shock allowed from the radio. And you can see that this doesn't clearly work. I mean, this is like not matching at all. And if you look at this, you can basically say, in a conservative way, you can probably say that, okay, you can also take some projection effects into account. You can change the radius of curvature a bit. You can play with these numbers. But it seems pretty clear that at least if there is a shock present, so if there's a shock present, the Mach number must be smaller than roughly 1.6. There is clearly not a Mach 3 shock. That's, you cannot hide that in the data. Thing. So that's very strange because if you take a one, Mach 1.6 shock, so that's like the highest you can ever get, and you plug that in this equation, you expect to find a radio injection spectral index. So that's basically the index at the front of the shock where you really freshly accelerate the electrons of minus 1.8 or steeper. So this is really steep, and that's completely different from what we observed, because what did we observe? We observed an injection spectral index of roughly minus 0.6, minus 0.7. So this is completely disagrees with kind of this finding. So basically what the conclusion here is that apparently in this case, at least for this case, you cannot use the radio spectral index as an indication of the Mach number, because it just gives you completely the wrong number. It gives you a Mach number of 2.8 or higher, and that's not what we observed. I don't think we can hide the 2.8 shock in the data. So somehow this formula is actually not applies to this relic. So basically something that's probably wrong with a simple physical idea about this, this is diffusive shock acceleration theory. Apparently this is not going on. Uh, at least it's not this simple. Uh, so what is, what is the solution? So there are various solutions, but my favorite solution uh, till now is 
um, if you have reacceleration, um, then actually you can come up, you can ex you can kind of explain this. So, if you have this fossil electrons present and you have a strong shock, then basically what you get is nothing else than diffusive shock acceleration, and you follow this formula. And we already so basically you start with a fossil population which typically has kind of a steep spectrum. You accelerate with the shock and you end up with a new spectral index which is flatter, set by the shock Mach number, uh, according to this formula. And this is not what we observed. So there, but there is the second case. So if you start with a relatively flat uh, spectral uh, distribution of fossil plasma, and then you have only a very weak shock, so a very weak shock is not basically capable of changing the spectral index of the distribution. What it can only basically do is boost the distribution. So you basically can only change the normalization of the slope. And in that way, basically, you preserve the spectral index of the fossil plasma, and you get the kind of, you just move the line up. And this might be the case, what's happening in this cluster. So basically, we start with this. There's a very weak shock, Mach 1.2, maybe 1.1. It's extre extremely weak. The only thing what happens is basically, we boost the spectrum up, and then that's what we see. So in that case, basically, you cannot link the observed spectral index to the Mach number. So that link is gone. That link only works in case of stronger shocks. So maybe that's going on. Of course, that's a possibility. There are other possibilities, but this is, so this might be evidence for reacceleration in this cluster. So, yeah, it's more consistent with this scenario. Now, the last uh, point, I will show some work in progress. So what you can also do is you can look at emission at higher redshift, so that our next steps, you can expand frequency ranges, you can see it a bit lower, but you can also go to higher energies, and you can look at radio emission from the cosmic web, and you can look at magnetic fields. I will not talk about this because I'm running out of time, I'm seeing here. Um, so going to higher redshift, so I start some, started some initial work here, to look basically at clusters beyond the redshift of a half, because basically very few examples are known of diffuse radio emission. There are actually only one example. And for that, we basically did DMRT observations. So the first question, of course, is do these sources occur at higher redshifts? Well, of course, naively would say, yeah, of course, why not? But of course, you want to detect these sources, and that's difficult. But by observing a sample of the 20 most massive cluster and processing in kind of special ways, so making basically low and high resolution images, where the low resolution images basically remove the point sources to basically to bring out possible diffuse emission. And by observing a sample of 20 clusters, we found basically four examples where if you do this kind of like processing, in the low resolution images, you indeed find examples of clusters with diffuse emission at high redshifts. In this case, the higher redshift is this cluster here. It's a merging cluster. And these are the X-ray images of these clusters here. And there's also interesting here is the Phoenix cluster. So we also find emission in the Phoenix cluster. And this is likely a mini halo in a relaxed cluster. So this is the Phoenix cluster. You see the other clusters are all kind of like indicative of merging structure. So this is just uh, still work in progress, but um, basically showing that it's possible to now go to higher redshift. In this case, still with a GMRT, not with lower because that's just too much work to observe too many clusters. The other thing is you can expand the frequency ranges. You can go to low frequency, so I show, show another example here of LOFR, work with I did, so you can observe at 60, 30, and 20 megahertz. Below that you cannot observe because the, the ionosphere completely blocks you off. It's kind of like, it becomes opaque. Uh, just trying to do like infrared observation from the ground, like mid-infrared, which is impossible. Um, but at least this is kind of a new frequency range, so at least we can now probe like really below 100 megahertz to basically look at if the radio spectrum behaves as what we expected. And I highlight some other work here from Kimberly Amick and from Francesco de Gasbrien, which also show images basically below 100 megahertz. And these are really the first really images of cluster emission at this frequency range ever made, because this is extremely hard, because the ionosphere becomes like crazy. Like this image I showed was at 150 megahertz, but if you go to 30 megahertz, everything just basically gets worse, like by a factor of uh, five in this case. So um, that's really hard stuff. The sources basically go all over the sky at some point. And at some point they basically move below the horizon sometimes and you, you lose everything. That's basically what's happening here. Now, on the other hand, you can also go to higher frequencies. And you can use single disk. For example, this is 8 gigahertz Evelsberg, where you can detect kind of the toothbrush. It's very low resolution, even if 100 meter disk. Um, but you can even go to 30 gigahertz, like with Karma. So this is, again, the toothbrush, and this is the sausage. You see, it's barely detected, but you can actually detect these things really all the way up to 30 gigahertz. And this is at 16 gigahertz with the AMI telescope in, uh, in, in the UK. And you're thinking, why well, do this? Well, if you go expand your frequency bands, you get surprises. And by doing this, we immediately got surprises. Like, what we thought was that radio relics have power low spectra. And this high frequency measurement basically directly indicates this is not the case. So, big surprise, and we don't really have the solution yet. But there are possibilities. Another thing is, by going to low frequencies, what we 
saw was that the radio spectra have a parallel uh, shape, but they have spectral indices which are actually too flat. Because if you have acceleration, you have cooling, you get some balance, of course, because the shocks have long lifetimes of like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 years. You get some cooling balance, and this cooling balance basically implies that you always must find a spectral index, which is like an integrated spectral index for the entire source, which is steeper than minus 1. And that's actually what we not find for this, uh, for this relic in this case. So this basically says that this balance is maybe not set up and actually shows that maybe shocks are really evolving or shocks are encountering fossil plasma recently. So basically they changed their properties on time scales of 10 to the 7 maybe, uh, 10 to the 6 years, and not only on time scales of like set by the hydrodynamics, like the 10 to the 8 years roughly what you have for the shocks propagating outwards. So this was just a surprise by just going to different frequency ranges. Totally unexpected. And this is my last slide, so what you can do is what you really want to do, and what's really exciting but extremely hard, but I will try to do it. What you want to do is trace the cosmic web, because I again show this picture. Till now we have looked at these clusters where this radio emission is present, but what if you could actually trace this kind of cosmic web structures in the radio, because there are shocks there. We saw that in the simulations. And we basically don't know the answer what we will find. But there, is, there are shocks, that's for sure, because the simulations all indicate that. The question is, of course, are particles accelerated there? But if that's the case, and you can go deep enough, then you can maybe find these things in a radio and basically have that as a way of tracing the cosmic web, which is really hard in other ways. It would be kind of a unique probe of the cosmic web. And the first thing to probably probe is like to look uh, between filaments between double clusters, because this is where the cosmic web is typically somewhat brighter. So that's probably the first thing what we will try to target. And for this, you need LOFR or SKA. Even LOFR, this is kind of hard. We don't really know, but you, of course we will try, but maybe only with the SKA, but that remains on the... Basically, the model predictions are not really clear yet. So in the optimistic models, you can detect it with low. In the pessimistic models, you need SKA to find this. And we can only know for sure by just observing this. And uh, yeah, this is my final slide. So this is like just the future. So this is the toothbrush cluster you can see in the center here. And this basically shows what you can do with such a telescope by surveying the full sky. This is just one pointing. You see basically what an amount of sky you get and what kind of science you can do by just even doing one pointing. And if we can do... We what we will basically will do is over the next year we will do this kind of like images all sky. And this will be like really like a revolution in radio with radio surveys because this is basically targeted at extremely deep observations, but then just all sky in a couple of years. Of course, processing is really hard, um, but the observations are already being acquired and uh, we're starting to process the first uh, fields for that. And this is my summary, and I stop here, otherwise Akos will start complaining. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure you said it, it has to be less than you know, 1.6 based on the Chandra data. So have you really, so the, but the constraining thing is you still have to be able to see that the shot, you know, the feature in the radio. So have you actually done this in detail? Because you know, it depends on this, the brightness distribution in the two bands behind the shots. Have you, you know, taken something and turned it on its side and, and, and looked at it in projection to see if you can, in, in detail, to see if you can get that difference just from projection? Actually, um yeah, we have done this, but actually an, an easier way to do this is basically we have the polarization, and the polarization fraction also tells you something about the angle. And by uh, measuring the polarization, we roughly know what the limits are on the angle are. But we have not... What you do would work if you, ex if you completely know what the brightness distribution is along the thing, but that's also the, what we don't really know. But if you look in detail, it's actually very complex there. So it's already, like, broken up into smaller things and filamentary structures, so... Um, the 1.6 is, though, like a very rough number because you could already see, you could already say, oh, the 1.5 didn't work there because you could already saw, basically, that it was not really a good fit. So it is some extra margin, but we didn't really project it like all the way because I think there's still a 30 degree, basically, angle allowed by the polarization. But I think a 30, yeah. So I guess the question, if you took a, a, a you know, 2.8 x-ray shots and tilted at 30 degrees, what, what mass number would you get from the x-ray? Right. I don't know the answer, but it's an interesting question, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not going to be 2.8. Yeah. 
sensitive they are to something like the projection effect. So and the radio. Yeah, it's, it's it's based in the same question. But yeah, the radio is less sensitive, but the X-ray, of course, could be sensitive. And also, like, you assume, like, a complete spherical shock front, right? If it's not spherical, then also it's, it becomes murkier and it becomes kind of smeared out. And if you look in simulations, actually, there are not perfect shock fronts. They are more complex. They have different weaker shocks sometimes ahead of him, like in the back of it. So it's, the picture is not as clean as just seeing a jump and saying, okay, this is it. And this is the Mach number. This is the error on the Mach number. It's more murky. <laughs> No, no, these are the shock in the key. No, 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 this is the cold front. This is the inner one. It's two point something and you go to the next Oh you want to see the cold front? Yeah. Oh okay. Okay. No, I want to see the Well the cold front is later. The cold front is just here. This is the cold front. This is the shock because here the discontinuity is at four, I think, and the other one is at two. So this ah, is no, no, no. Um, so they are inverted. No, they are not. So you have to be careful about the radius. So basically what I did oh, is because you can see it by eye, I don't put the radius here because you have to put the radius for the shock here. Uh -huh but not for the cold front. So okay. be careful about the de definition of radius. It's not the same. Okay. So that's, yeah. Um, it's the center of curvature. Yeah, it's the center of curvature. So okay. it's not the same. So, yeah. Do you know the next slide also? I'm not sure what the next slide is. Okay. Oh, here. Yeah. Um, so here, I'm assuming that when you're taking the um, uh, sectors over the north one radius, you're assuming that you can reduce the curvature? Have you tried changing it? No, but that's something I want to try, basically, to see what uncertainty is in there. And what I also, I didn't tell here, but I fixed the location of the shock. Of course, I fixed it at the location where the relic is present, because that's basically my theory I want to test. But I didn't change the radius of curvature, and that's interesting to do, to just try, basically see how sensitive it is on putting that number. But the one constraint I have, I want to prove it traces the shock. So I'm completely constrained by that. So that had to, has to match my, my, basically, sector. If it doesn't match that sector, I completely redact it because that I don't want to test. So the only allowance I can do is I can change the radius of curvature within the limits that, I, that the sector really traces the edge of the relic. Because then basically I'm not testing the theory anymore that the relic traces the shock, that the shock is somewhere else. The radius of curvature, I mean, you have a linear relic, so the radius of curvature. No, it's not linear. If you look at the head of the toothbrush, it actually is curved. Oh, you mean you just mentioned the edge? Yeah, okay. yeah. But there is some uncertainty in how curved that is, and that you would like to vary and see what the influence is. That's true, yeah. So first thing, I didn't get the X-ray luminosity. This is from the literature, this spot. But uh, I presume what they did is just they took a big circle over the cluster and probably, I think, just computed the luminosity in a certain band and then assumed a certain global temperature for the cluster and then scaled it to the appropriate band for where this correlation was plotted. No, this is just a historical reason. So what this done is people use the Rosat energy band. And that's because we have observations. A lot of clusters were initially observed with Rosat. So people like to measure the X-ray luminosity in the Rosat band. So from 0 0.5, uh, no, sorry, from 0 0.1 to 2.4 kV. That's just for historical reason because Rosat people started measuring in that band. And that's why this correlation was built up in that energy band. There's no, you could also do the correlation in some other energy band or do the bolometric X-ray luminosity or actually just take the cluster mass. That's the best way to do it because you don't want to actually have the cluster X-ray luminosity there. What you really mean is the cluster mass. So people also put Y as Z there because that's also a tracer of cluster mass. So it's just a proxy of cluster mass, but this is like an observable, right? So you have X-ray luminosity and mass is not directly observable, right? So, but if you have weak lensing, you could also put a mass there and that's actually, at the world, that's the same correlation and people have done that.
going to go a little bit off the edge of the bus as you look. You actually see the magnetic field starting to wander. And you're actually getting further what the magnetic field is ahead of the shock. Yes, that's exactly one of the main goals of this new deep GLA obser GVLA observation where you can resolve the width and basically start seeing if you go in detail, actually it starts to change around at this kind of like filamentary structures. You expect that to some extent maybe. I don't know the answer of that, but that's exactly a very interesting thing to look for. You don't see, you don't see it in the data you have here. No, because the data presented was pretty low resolution, so I didn't resolve it. Um. Do you have uh, estimates of the actual electron density? Yes, from Suzaku, for example, or from Chandra or XMM. Very low, like 10 to the minus 4. So, yeah. Yeah. It really reminded me of the ultra speed relic in um, about 133. It also has like these like weird little tail. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have any idea where those, where those things come from? All that like fine elementary structure behind these things? I think to some extent, a little bit more. 